Father, we, we are living in dark times. We see evil growing and expanding. But I pray that today we will take courage that so is the wheat. Your people are also growing. New people are coming to faith in Jesus Christ, even here in our little neck of the woods. And Father, I pray that this morning we will take courage to be faithful to the mission that you have left us here to accomplish. Help us to remember that we are not alone, but that we are empowered by your spirit. Jesus, you told us as you left, all power and authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. And so if we are not powerless, we are not strong in ourselves, but we are powerful through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. I pray that we are emboldened for our witness for Jesus Christ. Help us not to be discouraged by the evil that we see around us, for they are the signs that the end is near. And may we live with passion, without excuses, with focus. I pray that you will build conviction in our hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Matthew chapter 13, you may be seated. Matthew chapter 13. I took just a brief break last week. This is the fourth of four sermons that I preached from this passage. Everybody had one idea of what the kingdom of God was going to look like. When the Messiah arrives, everything changes. Righteousness will fill the earth. He will rule the nations with a rod of iron. He's going to heal all manner of disease. He's going to raise Israel to become prominent among the nations. These are promises that were hopes and expectations of the Jewish people. But these promises were all contingent on the Jewish people receiving Jesus as their Messiah. And as we have watched through the opening books of the of the opening chapters of the book of Matthew that's precisely what's not happening the religious leaders the political leaders and mass people are rejecting Jesus Christ even those who would appear to be receiving him receive him only so far as they serve their own purposes not God's purposes Immediately before this chapter begins, they just attributed the work of Jesus Christ to the devil. And so the hopes that they had, the messianic hopes of this incredible age of prosperity and blessing and righteousness that covers the earth, that plan is about to be changed just a little bit. And so Jesus begins in Matthew chapter 13 unfolding some ideas about this previously unknown period of time of the kingdom of God. Namely, that there would be a space of time before he came back here to rule and reign in righteousness. And during that space of time, as the king is away... The time period would be characterized as a time of both growing righteousness right alongside growing evil. Both Jesus would be at work in the lives of people, redeeming a humanity for himself. If you're in Christ this morning, say amen. amen. You're part of that reaping. You've come to see yourself a sinner. You've come to recognize that there is salvation through no one else. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved in the name of Jesus Christ. And that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. He came unto his own and his own did not receive him, but as many as did receive Jesus, to them he gave the power to become 
sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And by faith in Jesus Christ, even today, God is reaping the harvest of souls for his kingdom. But that's not all that's growing. During this space before the king arrives to claim his rightful throne here on this earth, right alongside his plan, Satan is actively planting tares among the wheat. So that's one of the surprises of this time period that they had not foreseen. It's one of the mysteries of this kingdom that we've looked at in the past. Look with me, if you will, at verse 31. The parable of the wheat and the tares, which is the planting of good and the planting of evil right alongside one another, is immediately in verses 24 through 30. So verse 31 follows right on the heels of that. He says this, he put another parable before them, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Let's look at the next one as well. Verse 33, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Now follow me. In verses 24 through 30, the mystery that he revealed is that there was going to be a time where there would be good and evil growing simultaneously right alongside of one another. I think it is clear enough when he talks about the mustard seed, he's talking about this little itty bitty seed. It's planted in the ground, and as it's cultivated, that little seed will grow to become a tremendous bush. And in time, a bush large enough that a tree, that birds can come and make, make nests in its branches. And I believe the idea is he's expounding on the wheat and the tares. How are they going to grow? They're going to grow slowly. As Jesus is speaking to this audience, he's got 12 followers, and one of them is a fake. He has 11 followers. By the time Jesus dies and is risen again, he has 70 followers. Those 70 people are the reason that you and I are gathered here together this morning because of their faithfulness some 2,000 years ago. And if the Lord should tarry for any length of time, the earth will continue to be populated with millions of people who believe in Jesus Christ because of our faithfulness in this generation. Amen? But the idea is that it's not happening fast. It's happening slow and methodical. Let's look at the second parable. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Just as I believe the parable of the mustard seed is expounding how the wheat will grow, starting out small, expanding and, and broadening and becoming a large entity wherever it's planted. And even right here, we would say that the Northeast is one of the hardest places, some of the hardest soil in the United States. Someone please say amen. Oh, come on, that was weak. The Northeast is some of the hardest soil in the United States. Amen? amen. It's hard to do gospel work in this area. And yet gathered this morning in pulpits up and down Route 31 and up and down Route 11, men are proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. So it's grown wherever it's landed. Not fast, but it's grown. The second parable, the parable of the leaven. I believe that this parable is expounding also the idea of evil. Just as the wheat will grow like a mustard seed, small and get large, so the tares will grow. I want to be clear. Some commentators disagree with my interpretation. One notable one is John MacArthur. He believes that the leaven is a picture. It's just He's just reiterating again. You put a little in and it spreads throughout the whole loaf. The contention I have with that is this. And again, I, I'm on shaky ground anytime you're questioning our brother John MacArthur. But nonetheless, as I look throughout scripture, leaven is fairly consistently viewed as a negative way and not in a positive way. Look at some references here, Leviticus 2.11. Do not use yeast in preparing any of the grain offerings you present to the Lord, because no yeast or honey may be burned as a special gift presented to the Lord. Now that's not too rough, but look at this one. 
1 Corinthians 5, 8. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Or this one. Now, this is, no, notice this. We're in Matthew 13 in our text. In Matthew 16, just a couple chapters, he's going to give this warning to his disciples. Jesus said to them, watch and beware of the what? Leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Lastly, Galatians 5.9, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And in that particular context, it's talking about sin that goes unchecked in the church, permeates the whole church. Therefore, when you can identify unrepentant sin in the church, remove that unhealthy portion so that it doesn't contaminate the rest. Is that better? Sorry about that. Okay. Can you hear me better now? All right. So again, some commentators say that, again, this is just a reiteration of the idea that a little bit is going to spread over time and fill the whole. But coming out of the wheat and tares, I feel, and given the idea that leaven is throughout Scripture viewed in a negative light, I think that what he's saying here is the kingdom of heaven, just as a few little people, this small group of 70 people after the death and resurrection of Christ, this small group of 70 people is going to permeate wherever they're planted, they're going to grow into a large thing. I think he's also saying that evil, and here's one of the other reasons exegetically why I would say this, that a little bit of leaven comes in and it fills until it fills the whole lump. If you had to compare the influence of the church in this world to the influence of evil in this world, which one does it appear is larger? Evil. As we read our Bibles and we talk about the end times, as we look at the time when Jesus returns to this earth, what kind of earth does he come back to? An earth where the church is powerful and mighty and we're transforming culture and we're transforming politics and we're transforming policies? Is that the world that he comes back to? No. When Jesus comes back, they're trying to crush the church or the believers, I should say. They're trying to crush Israel. They're trying to stamp out every, every thing that reminds anyone of God. Folks, what do we see happening in our culture? We see evil permeating and growing in every category of life. Really? I want to amen on that? Maybe you live in a different place than I do. more to come on that in weeks ahead. I believe it's a foreshadowing. Jesus is giving a foreshadowing. Yes, the church is going to prosper in the places where it goes, but this evil, this planting of tares among the weeds, in particular in the church, have churches been plagued with false doctrine? Have churches been contaminated by sin? You bet they have. Let's take a look now at the parables found in verse 44. So he explains the parable of the weeds and the tares, which again is why I think that the mustard seed and the leaven are connected to the understanding of the wheat and the tares. Now, in the parable of the hidden treasure and then the parable of the pearl of great price, I think he's going to talk about the nature of discovering the truth of Jesus Christ, the nature of becoming a wheat. Notice this, we were all tares. <laughs> we were all lost in sin and under the power of the wicked one, the scripture teaches us. We were all at one time children of disobedience, deceived and wicked workers in our bodies. So I believe that the parable of the hidden treasure and the parable of the pearl of great price are explaining to us the experience of going from becoming a tear to becoming wheat. What is that like? How will it happen? And so he explains it to them. Look with me at verse 44. 
the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, verse 45, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. The only difference that I observe, and I shouldn't say the only, there are several differences I observe between these two parables. In verse 44, something is discovered by accident. Do you see that? He's considering this field and he's walking along and all of a sudden, hey, there's a hollow spot here in the ground and he digs down and he's like, oh, there's great treasure in this field. He covers it back up. He goes away. He wasn't looking for the treasure. He just stumbled across it. Some people discover Christ quite by accident. It's not because they're searching for Jesus Christ. I think in our generation, you know people whose testimonies, in fact, there may be some who are gathered here this morning, you know Jesus Christ because you found a Gideon Bible when you were in a hotel somewhere. You know Jesus Christ because you, picked, you were a waitress who picked up a tip on the table and somebody left a, a gospel tract there and you opened it and you read it. Or maybe on some weird evening in a quiet moment, you were driving home and you dialed into Christian radio and you heard a sermon on the gospel of Jesus Christ and got saved. Or perhaps you were minding your own business and scanning through the channels and you saw a Billy Graham crusade on television. I know people like this who watched the Billy Graham crusades and by accident, not because they were searching for anything, but God in his love and mercy was pursuing them and allowed them to intersect with the gospel and they came to know Jesus Christ. I won't have you raise hands, but there's some of you here this morning. That's your testimony. It was a coworker at work who took that chance and invited you out for lunch or invited you out for coffee, formed a relationship with you and began telling you about Jesus Christ. Amen? But then there's others. And I believe that they're represented in verses 45 through 46. Here, the merchant is actually looking for something that he hasn't found yet. I believe that there's another way that people discover truth. And this is, there's something turning in their chest. They know that they don't, they're not okay with God. And like masses of our uh, culture believe that if my good outweighs my bad, I'm going to somehow make it to heaven. If you believe that, you are dead, dead Bible wrong. The Bible does not teach that we are saved by being good people. Amen? In fact, the Bible says just the opposite. It says, you aren't good. There are none that are righteous. There are none who do good. What we do is we compare ourselves with other people and we say, well, compared to so-and-so, I've never murdered anybody. I've never committed adultery. I've never stolen, blah, blah, blah. We go on like that. We compare ourselves with other sinful beings instead of comparing ourselves with God in whose image we were created. But God allows some people to have an overwhelming sense of their sin. And they know that the world doesn't have answers. And as they dabble in various religions, they recognize, yeah, I know, this religion tells me that I just have to believe and do the best that I can. But what do I do on the days that I fail miserably? You ever had one of those days? What do I do on the days when I don't act very Christian? Where I don't have very good thoughts? We have those days, don't we? But see, our salvation is secure because the gospel teaches that Jesus Christ did everything that's required for my salvation. My salvation, our salvation, a saved person's salvation rests on the completed work of Jesus Christ and not in their own works. Hallelujah and amen. I believe that God puts this burden, this burning in some people's hearts and causes them to begin searching. And in searching, they finally found what they're looking for. Lee Strobel would be a contemporary author that I think a lot of us can recommend. He knew something credible had happened to his wife and he couldn't explain it. She's either a kook or this is true. And he wrote what I believe is a great book. 
on the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, a reporter for the Chicago Tribune, and he went and spoke with all of the professionals in every field of archaeology, biology, and chemistry to find out, is there real evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ? And at the end of that long discovery, he came to the conclusion, Jesus is real. He is risen, and I must believe in him. And he was saved. How about the Ethiopian eunuch of Acts, what is it, four or five, somewhere in there? This man is confused, he's traveling, he's reading one of the Old Testament scrolls, he's very confused by what he's reading, he can't figure it out, and he's like, I know that there's something significant here, I just can't piece it together. And doesn't God send the prophet Nathan to him? God zaps the prophet Nathan, beams him up, shoots him over here to where the Ethiopian is. He knocks on the door. He says, hey, you need some help with anything? He's like, yeah. Can you explain to me what this is? He explained it to him, and instantly he got it and received Jesus Christ and was born again on the spot. Amen? Good stuff. So we see that some discover the gospel of Jesus Christ by accident. Some find Jesus Christ after a laborious search. We see that both are alike in this way. There's great joy for both of them, isn't there? But we see that there is a sense of veiled, in particular with the one who kind of stumbles across this, isn't that? He's got to remain secret. In our American constitutional democracy, freedom of religion is a protected right in our Constitution. This can confuse our understanding of these parables because the religious freedoms we enjoy are not characteristic of most times and places in the world. Discovering Jesus and the gospel is thrilling and joyful on the one hand, but it can come at an incredibly high price. In some places, believers must remain secret for announcing their their conversion is an automatic death sentence. For others, it means being cast out of the family or shunned. I have an article I want to read, just a portion of an article. It's from opendoors.com. What does persecution look like in North Korea? What is life like for Christians there? That's the title of the article. I'll read just a paragraph. Here's what it says. Being discovered as a Christian is a death sentence in North Korea. If you aren't killed instantly, you will be taken to labor camp as a political criminal. These inhumane prisons have horrific conditions and few believers make it out alive. Everyone in your family will share the same punishment. Now, hear me on that. It might be one thing if I want to go off and pursue and find Jesus Christ or if I should stumble across a gospel track and want to believe. It might be one thing that I'm willing to accept that risk. But the, quantif- the, 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 the heavier pressure is that if I declare that I am a Christian, I impugn everyone else in my family who has not made that decision. Kim Jong-un is reported to have expanded the the system of prison camps in which an estimated 50 to 70,000 Christians are currently imprisoned. Most Christians are, are unable to meet with other believers and have to keep their faith entirely hidden. Listen to this. There are even stories of husbands and wives not knowing for many years that their spouse was also a Christian. In this world where good and evil grow side by side, some of the places where the gospel grows are not easy places. And while they have discovered the most amazing joy that their sins can be forgiven, that they can have the promise of eternal life and resurrection and meet the Lord one day, while that is incredible and awesome, some of them are paying an immense price. And so while there's joy, there's this veiled, you can't just be out in the open. Following Jesus is the most costly decision you will ever make. For me, as a Christian young person, I got saved, I would say, as a seventh grader. It determined who I would marry and who I would not marry, who I would date and who I wouldn't date. It determines the movies I watch, the places I go, the way I talk, the things I spend my time and money on, the values I hold, the candidates I support, the way I raise my kids, the habits I formed, and the music I love. 
I cannot think of a way, and if you've been in Christ for any length of time, neither can you. You cannot identify a way in which your relationship with Jesus Christ has not changed you. Amen? The point of these parables is not how expensive it is to become a Christian. Instead, the point is that receiving the kingdom by faith in Jesus Christ is a huge, life-changing decision that may well cost you everything. It becomes the controlling influence in your life, shaping everything about you. John MacArthur said this, Salvation costs nothing in the sense of payment, but everything in the sense of surrender. So I give you some quick notes parables of 13 44 through 46 in summary number one the kingdom is either discovered or it's sought secondly the kingdom's discovery brings joy often with a degree of caution or secrecy today if one should be so blessed in north korea to receive jesus christ as savior and lord i promise you they are not going to get the outline of a fish to put on their car They're not going to be out there telling all their friends. Number three, the kingdom is costly, but worth it. You see, in the parable, they sold all that they had to acquire that field. They paid tremendous. It sold everything that they might acquire one pearl of great price. Number four, the kingdom disclosure is delayed. As Christians, our hope is not for the right now. Our hope is for seeing the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? We better keep that straight. Can you see that? It becomes important for us to have this up here as I move to our next parable. I know I'm moving quickly, but I want to get out of Matthew 13 today. So bear with me just a little longer. The parable of the net. Let's look at it together. Verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, In verses 48 through 50, there is a gathering and a sorting by the angels at the end of the age. This is nothing new that's being revealed in this verse. Why? Because in chapter 13, verses 39 through 42, look with me there, 1339. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. This is talking about the wheat and the tares. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are the who? The angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be what? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. So the idea of the angels at the very end of the age, gathering all of humanity, sorting out the unrighteous from the righteous, judging the unrighteous and allowing the righteous to enter the kingdom, that's not new. The part to me that appears to be new, the new mystery here, is that they gathered fish of every kind. In their Jewish way of thinking, the Messiah and the coming kingdom was limited primarily to the nation of Israel first. What they may not have anticipated is that this message of the kingdom is not going to be limited to Israel. In fact, very few from Israel would actually receive the message of the kingdom. Instead, the message of the kingdom was going to go global. Remember when Jesus departed, what did he say? He said, go ye therefore into all the world. And make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I believe the new information, the thing that he's revealing to them there, here, is very similar to what Paul revealed in Romans chapter 11. That a time of Gentile belief was about to come. Where Israel, few in Israel would be saved. Millions and millions and millions in the Gentile world would be coming to faith in Christ. Christ. 
I want to reiterate that the judgment that is spoken of here is that future judgment that will take place just prior to the inauguration of Christ's earthly kingdom, which immediately follows the seven-year tribulation as we understand it in this church. And I say that because there are awesome brothers who believe the gospel just like we do, but we disagree on how all of this will unfold. That said, I stand with firm conviction that this cle most clearly represents what the scriptures teach. They would convictionally disagree. So here we are, and I just I wish I had a laser pointer, but I know the laser pointer on that's not going to work. So if you'll forgive me, I'm going to come over here, play the role of a teacher. This is Christ's resurrection. That happened when? In the past. You'll see this is the church age. The church is unique from Israel in that the church is made up of believers of every tribe, tongue, and nation. The whole Old Testament finds the main focus of its, of its uh, point right there in Israel. Once Jesus dies and rises again, the focus is no longer on Israel. The focus is everywhere else. That's characteristic of the church age. About five or six weeks ago, I preached a message on how this rapture is different than the second coming. I believe that God is fulfilling his plan through the church right now. And because God's plan with the church is being played out, God's plan with Israel is on pause. When God removes the church from the earth, he's going to resume his plan with Israel, and he's going to do some marvelous things on planet earth at that time. We took a whole sermon to talk about the differences that exist between the rapture and the second coming. At the rapture, we are going to Jesus Christ. Instead of the second coming, Christ and the church, which are now in heaven, are coming down to earth to help Jesus Christ establish his 1,000-year reign down here on the earth. You see this space of time called the tribulation. Now, here's how this is connected to today's message. We talked about the leaven and it being put into loaves and it filling and expanding the loaves until all was leavened. What happens during this seven-year period of time? Evil runs rampant everywhere. I believe that the church is playing a role of stopping that. We are the brakes that are holding this thing on. If believers were not here, imagine where America would be. Just think about that. If you take every Bible-believing Christian out of the United States and back up to elections, where would we be? Now take every believer all across the planet, take their influence out of neighborhoods and workplaces and everywhere, off of playgrounds and out of schools, and there are no other believers here. What do you think is going to grow? Good or evil? He tells us some remarkable things are going to happen at the three and a half year mark here. And those years will get darker and darker and darker until there is nothing but darkness. I shouldn't say nothing but darkness. Because during this time period, the Bible tells us that God is going to, he's going to do some amazing things with Israel. And Israel is going to do an amazing work of evangelizing the world at that time. And even during that period of time, the wheat and the tares are going to grow side by side. But guess who's got a head start? The tares or the wheat? The tares. Everybody who gets saved here, guess what? They're baby Christians. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, 144,000 Jewish men will be saved instantaneously at the very beginning of the tribulation. I believe that they will play a role of evangelists in the world at that time. The Bible tells us that during that time period, there will be two figures in the city of Jerusalem proclaiming the eternal gospel and preaching to the world. They will be bringing plagues on this earth for the evil that's unfolding here. Antichrist will arise and destroy those two people and they will treat it like it's Christmas because of their hatred of those two witnesses. Talked about a lot of things. As you come to the end, that second coming, this arrow here, the second arrow coming down, it is my belief and conviction that the church will be taken out. We will be in heaven with God and we will return with Jesus Christ to this earth in our glorified bodies to rule and reign with Christ. 
this is when the nations will be gathered before the Lord Jesus Christ. This is where it will be sorted out who were followers of Jesus Christ and who were followers of unrighteousness. Many will be saved. Those who live and survive this judgment will populate this kingdom in normal human bodies like we have. They will have children and many of them will live very, very long and prosperous lives in God's coming kingdom. Those who do not know Jesus Christ will suffer the judgment and the torment of hell that's described in this passage. Got that? That's what the disciples said. They said, yes, we understand these things. Verse 51, have you stood all these things? They said to him, yes. And he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. He's saying, guys, you've learned some things about that kingdom. That when the kingdom comes, I'm going to give sight to the blind. I'm going to heal the lame. The dumb will speak. I'll cast out demons. I'm going to make all disease go away. I'm going to cure cancer. It'd be good, won't it? Did Jesus do those things as he walked this earth? You bet he did. When he comes again as king, he'll do it again. Guys, you've learned those things. Those things are right to anticipate. The part that you don't get is that there's going to be a space of time between where we are right now and when I come to do those things. And every scribe who is trained in the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings some old things that you learned from the Old Testament and some new things that you've learned from Jesus Christ. How does this chapter end out? We started this passage. Jesus performed a miracle and they attributed the power of the miracle to who? Satan. Verse 53. When Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there. And coming to his hometown, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. We started this teaching through Matthew chapter 13 by saying, because of their rejection of Jesus, some changes to their idea of what the kingdom of God would look like was about to come. How do these parables end? What's the very next thing that happens? Mounting rejection. And as we follow the narrative of Jesus through the remainder of Matthew, how will the book of Matthew culminate? In his death by Roman crucifixion. What have we learned about the current phase of the kingdom? I I break from my, if you're familiar with theology, what I believe is a dispensational understanding of Scripture. What I just talked with you in that timeline is a dispensational understanding of Scripture. I break from some of my dispensational brothers on this one thing. I believe that the kingdom is in part operating today. I say that because there are things like the forgiveness of sins. That was part of the promised kingdom. The sending of the Holy Spirit. Do you have the Holy Spirit in you? You do. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. There's some other things that Jesus says that I think relate to the fact that the kingdom is here, but the kingdom, but the king himself is absent, notwithstanding he will come again. Uh, some have coined this by the phrase, already, not yet. The kingdom is already here, but it's not yet here in its full and final form. That said, what have we learned about the current phase of the kingdom? Here it is. Both Christ and Satan are active, sowing seed at the same time. Secondly, 
The righteous understand the gospel, endure suffering, and are eternally focused and bear fruit. Third, both righteousness and evil are growing in the world at this time. And the harvest, which will happen at the very end of this age when the arrow came back down, the harvest will include people from every ethnic group. Number five, the age will end in judgment of the evil and righteous. The evil will be thrown into a burning furnace. And the righteous will inherit the coming kingdom. And lastly, the new revelations do not undermine the old promises. So I have one question and we'll be finished. As Jesus talked about the coming age, for you and I, it's all we've known. It's like a no-brainer. Duh, good and evil growing at the same time. But for these guys, this was mind-blowing. Because when Jesus came, when the Messiah came, everything changed. And what he was about to find out is that the good's going to grow right alongside the evil growing. This is very binary. You know what I mean by binary, ones and zeros? This is very binary. Every human being on earth is either a wheat or a tear. You are born into this world a tear. I used to, when I was in ministry in the city, we had a gospel track rack, and on that gospel track, one of my favorite tracks was this, it said, what to do to go to hell? And it had a big question mark on the front of it. And you open it up, and you're like, what? There's nothing on the inside. It was completely blank. It's pretty provocative, isn't it? You don't have to do anything to go to hell. You're born with a one-way ticket there. But if you want to go to heaven, if you want to be wheat, you have to know who Jesus is and what he came to do. You have to see yourself the sinner that God says you are. You have to know that God will judge your sin. You have to know that Jesus was different than you and I, born of a virgin. He was born without sin. My kids were all born with sin. I can attest to this. You can attest to this, but that's okay because your kids were born in sin too. And I see it in, in exchanges, right? But Jesus was not a sinner. He was born of the virgin, conceived of the Holy Spirit without sin. Why is that important, pastor? Because he was empty of sin, he could become the substitute for sinners like us, which draws us to our fourth conclusion Jesus died on the cross as a substitute payment for our sins. And he rose from the grave to prove his defeat over sin, death, and the grave. So pastor, tell me, what do I have to do? What do I have to do to be saved? How do I go from being a tear to becoming wheat? If I turn from my sin and receive him, God will save me. There has to be that willingness to say, yes, I'm guilty sinner, but I don't like my sin and I don't want my sin. And God promises that he'll send his Holy Spirit into you and he will change you and he will empower you to live in a whole new way. Not overnight, everything better, everything's fixed. You don't ever sin again, not overnight. But progressively throughout your life, you'll be growing in righteousness. This morning, if you're here and you'd like to receive Jesus Christ, I simply invite you to believe. I simply invite you to believe. There's no magic words. 
is simply who are you? Are you one of the wheat? Are you one of the tares? Here's how the tares are going to be treated by the Lord when he comes back. And whether you're alive when this event takes place or whether you're dead, the result is all the same. If you die without Jesus Christ, he has a place reserved for those who reject Christ. And he has eternal life for those who have received him. Simply yours for the taking. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for the word of God. I don't share my opinions, even though I've spoken of some things that there are disagreements among Bible scholars that we all respect. We would all agree on the certainty of evil and good growing simultaneously. We would all agree that the righteous are those who believe in Jesus Christ and will spend eternity with God. And the evil are those who've rejected Jesus Christ and will spend eternity suffering in the flames of eternal torment. So, Father, if we believe the word of God, this leaves us with one decision. To trust in Jesus Christ. And so listening online and gathered here this morning, Father, my prayer would be for those who do not yet know Jesus Christ. I pray that they would receive Jesus by faith, trusting in him. I pray that they would express that faith to you. Your word says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then, Father, by the power of your spirit, teach those who do not yet know Jesus as Savior and Lord. Teach them in this moment how to call upon the Lord Jesus Christ. By your spirit, teach them to acknowledge their sin. Teach them to acknowledge your judgment on their sin. Convince them of Jesus, the sinless Son of God. Convince them of his sufficient death and resurrection to pay the penalty for our sins. And may your spirit guide them as they ask Jesus to save their souls. Father, we pray that you've been glorified in our time together this morning. We pray that our song is a blessing to your heart as we express our trust in you and our longing to come and see you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.